Welcome aboard. You are set to begin IKG's Egypt on the Potomac field trip of Washington, D.C. This is an educational field trip. It is not a tour of the nation's capital. Created by Anthony Browder, director of IKG and author of Egypt on the Potomac and Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization, this field trip will increase your knowledge of ancient Egyptian and American history. It documents our research on the architectural, symbolic, and historical similarities between ancient Egypt and Washington, D.C. Over the course of this journey, you will learn about Egyptian influences on the layout and design of the nation's capital and the role the people of African ancestry played in the city's development. You will also learn about Egyptian influences on America's founding fathers, their affiliation with Masonic institutions, and the African origins of Freemasonry. You will visit Meridian Hill Park, the Scottish Rite Temple, and the House of the Temple. You will drive by Lafayette Park, the White House, and the Washington Monument. You will drive through LaFont Plaza and around Banneker Circle, and you will make your way to Capitol Hill for exciting views of the Library of Congress. Each of these locations provide clues that help you decode architecture and symbolism which have been hidden in plain sight. If you think about it, the best place to hide secrets is in the open, where everyone can see them. But you must first convince everyone that these secrets actually represent something of lesser significance. In order for us to help you decode these secrets, you must first increase your knowledge of ancient Egypt. You must take a journey back in time, down the Nile, and rediscover knowledge that has long since been forgotten. So, sit back, relax, sharpen your eye, and tune your ear so you'll know what you see and understand what you hear. Civilization, like humanity, began in Africa. And it is in Egypt where we find evidence documenting this nation as one of the most significant civilizations in history. The country we now know as Egypt was founded in 3200 BCE, before the Common Era, and was originally called Kemet. The people of Kemet were lovers of knowledge. They built numerous temples of learning along the Nile where they perfected the sciences of astronomy, mathematics, and architecture. Generations of social scientists develop systems of government, law, and religion which have influenced mankind for almost 6,000 years. These ancient people also studied the heavens, dividing the day into 24 hours and creating the earliest calendar of 365 and one quarter days. The Step Pyramid was the first building ever constructed and it still stands in the city of Saqqara. This 19-story skyscraper was built for King Zoser around 2600 BCE. It was designed by Imhotep, the world's first multi-genius. Less than 200 years later, Kemetic architects and engineers built 10 pyramids at the Giza Plateau. The most famous, the Great Pyramid, was built for King Khufu. The Great Pyramid of Khufu was comprised of nearly 4 million stone blocks each weighing an average of two and a half tons. This incredible monument was originally built to a height of 481 feet, that's 48 stories. From the time of its completion in approximately 2500 BCE until 1884 ACE, when the Washington Monument was completed, Khufu's Pyramid was the tallest man-made object on Earth. The base of the pyramid covers an area of 13 acres, that's seven city blocks, and each side of the pyramid measures 755 feet, over two football fields in length. There is enough stone in the Great Pyramid to build 33 Empire State Buildings, 
And like the Empire State Building or any other skyscraper, the Great Pyramid was not built by slave labor. It was built by stone masons who were masters of their craft. Every temple in Kemet was built by skilled craftsmen in accordance with precise architectural and engineering plans. And every temple was oriented to the sun or a specific celestial body. Ancient architects believed that a properly constructed and oriented temple would attract a specific nature or aspect of God whose spirit would dwell in the Holy of Holies inside the temple. Contrary to popular belief, the people of Kemet believed in one God. This supreme creator is often depicted as the sun and is the oldest symbol representing God, the creator of the universe. The sun was called by many names in Kemet. Three specific names refer to the sun's changing attributes as it journeyed across the sky. When the sun rose in the east, it was known as Kepre. This Kemetic word meant rebirth. When the sun reached its zenith at noon, it was called Re, a name that described the Creator on high. After the sun set in the west, it was called Amen, a Kemetic word meaning hidden or concealed. Many historians acknowledge Kemet as the source of the word Amen, the idea of a ray of sunlight, and concepts of rebirth and resurrection. The people of Kemet understood that the Creator manifests itself in everything, the air, water, earth, plants, and humans. Everything was thought to contain an aspect or principle of the Creator. Each individual aspect was called nature. Every nature was born as a set of twins, male and female neturu. Each represented the complementary balance of a specific aspect of the Creator. They were, in effect, the many parts of the one supreme Creator. It is from the word nature that we have derived the word nature. The terms Mother Nature and Father Time are just modern names for ancient Neturu. The people of Kemet lived in harmony with nature. They oriented themselves to the seasons of the year, the rising and setting sun, moon, and stars, and the annual flooding of the Nile, which heralded the beginning of the new year. The people of Kemet built their homes and their temples of life on the east bank of the Nile, where Kepre was reborn every morning. At noon, they looked at Ray on high, seeing within themselves the ability to also rise to great heights each and every day. They buried their dead and built their mortuary temples on the west bank of the Nile. This was to ensure that the souls of the departed would travel with Amen to the beautiful west every evening. Three of the most important Neturu were Asar, the first king of Kemet, Aset, his queen, and Heru, their son. The story of this African trinity was first recorded more than 6,000 years ago. It has been told and retold so many times that it is now difficult to distinguish myth from history. The story begins with Asar, the man who unified Upper and Lower Kemet and became the nation's first king. Asar introduced agriculture, writing, law, and government, and he was beloved by his subjects. Asar married a beautiful virgin named Aset, but before his honeymoon, Asar was assassinated by his jealous brother Set. Set not only murdered Asar, he also cut his body into 14 pieces and scattered them throughout the land. When Aset learned of the murder and dismemberment of her husband, she flooded the Nile with her tears and then sailed down the river in search of Asar's remains. Wherever Aset found a body part, she washed it carefully and anointed it with oils. 
A set only found 13 parts of Asara's body. By assembling all of the parts and wrapping Asara's body in bandages, a set created the first mummy in history. Naturally, a set was overcome with grief as she prepared to bury her husband. She grieved because she and Asar had never consummated their marriage, and she would never bear children by the man she loved. Miraculously, before his body was laid to rest, the spirit of Asar visited Aset and impregnated her. Nine months later, Aset, the virgin, gave birth to a son, Heru, on December 25th. This event was recorded in the temples of Luxor and Fele. If this story sounds familiar, remember that it is more than 6,000 years old and has been retold many, many times. Throughout his youth, Heru was told of the great deeds of his father and he prepared for the day he would avenge the murder of Asar and reclaim his father's kingdom. The battle between Heru and Set was the classic struggle between the forces of good and evil. Their struggle was depicted on the walls of the Temple of Edfu. When Set was finally defeated, Heru was declared the legitimate ruler of Kemet. Heru was miraculously transformed into a falcon and flew into heaven to receive his father's blessings. Upon returning to Kemet, Heru reclaimed his father's throne. At the moment of Heru's coronation, Asar was resurrected and declared ruler of the afterlife when he ascended to the throne of judgment. Father and son were now co-regents. Heru ruled the physical world in Kemet, and Asar ruled the spiritual realm in heaven. As we've already noted, symbolism was very important in Kemet. Heru was sometimes depicted as a falcon. This image later became a national symbol. The right eye of Heru was associated with the sun because a falcon has keen vision and like the sun, the symbol of the creator, it sees everything and everyone on the earth below. The resurrection of Asar was symbolized by a monolith called a Tekken. So, wherever you see a Tekken, remember that it is an African symbol representing the resurrection of Asar, an African king who died and was resurrected more than 6,000 years ago. It is equally important to remember that after Kemet was conquered, it was renamed Egypt by the Greeks. They also renamed Asar, Aset, and Heru. They called Asar Osiris, they called Aset Isis, and they called Heru Horus. Dozens of temples were built in Kemet, and each had a pair of Tekkenu at the entrance, one standing to the left and one to the right. The Tekken on the left represented yesterday. The one on the right symbolized tomorrow. The entrance to the temple represented today, the space which exists between yesterday and tomorrow. A pair of Tekkenu also represented the complementary and dual aspects of life, a male and female nature. 4,000 years ago, there were more than 1,200 Tekkenu in Kemet. Today, in Egypt, there are only seven. The Tekken that once stood to the right of the entrance of Luxor Temple was removed in 1833. It now stands at the Plaza de la Concorde in Paris, France. There is a Tekken in Central Park in New York City, one on the banks of the Thames River in London, England, and another in Istanbul, Turkey. There is a Tekken in Vatican City in the center of St. Peter's Square. There are 13 Tekkenu in Rome, many of which now stand in front of churches located throughout the city. In fact, the architectural design of the church steeple was inspired by the Tekkenu which stood in front of the temples of Kemet. The story of Asar, Aset, and Heru is embedded within symbolism and architecture throughout Washington, D.C. 
The mall is laid out in the form of a cross. The Capitol is in the east. The Lincoln Memorial is in the west. The Jefferson Memorial is in the south. And the White House is in the north. In the center of the horizontal and vertical axis of this cross stands the Washington Monument, the ancient symbol representing the resurrected Asar. Not only is the Washington Monument an African symbol, but the idea of a reflection pool is also of African origin. Every temple in Kemet had Tekenu and a sacred lake is seen here in the Temple of Karnak. Washington, D.C. is a city of monuments, and John Russell Pope designed many of them. In 1912, Pope submitted this design to the committee overseeing the creation of a memorial for Abraham Lincoln. It is a scale model of Khufu's Great Pyramid. The memorial committee rejected Pope's drawing because it was unoriginal, but they selected Henry Bacon's original design, which was actually a copy of the Parthenon, a Greek temple. The committee also selected Daniel French's original sculpture of Lincoln sitting in his temple. Further investigation reveals that French's statue of Lincoln was inspired by the statue of Ramesses II at the Temple of Abu Simbel in Egypt. Washington, D.C. is significant because it is the first planned capital built in modern times. It was designed by several of America's Masonic founding fathers, and they devised specific plans for their new capital long before the land was surveyed or the first spade of dirt was turned. Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution mandated that the new capital would be no larger than a 10-mile square. In 1791, George Washington, America's first Masonic president, announced that the capital would be built along the Potomac River on land ceded by Maryland on the East Bank and Virginia on the West. Washington hired Andrew Ellicott to survey the boundary of the 10-mile square. Ellicott hired Benjamin Banneker, an African scientist and astronomer, to survey the heavens so that the 10-mile square would be properly oriented to the sun, stars, and planets. Banneker worked throughout the night surveying the sky using the most sophisticated instruments of his era. He plotted the rising and setting of celestial bodies and recorded their positions in his notebook. Ellicott arrived at Banneker's work site every day before sunrise. He used Banneker's notes to plot his sight line so that the 10-mile square would be properly aligned to the heavens. These two surveyors worked for two and a half months, and they complemented each other's efforts. Banneker measured the heavens, and Ellicott measured the earth. Together, they established pathways which directed spiritual energy within the 10-mile square. Washington appointed Thomas Jefferson to supervise the survey and design of the capital city. Jefferson, as per Washington's instructions, told Banneker and Ellicott to begin their survey at Jones Point in Alexandria, Virginia. This was to be the southernmost point of the square. They were told to run a 10-mile sight line to the northwest, make a 90-degree turn, and run a second 10-mile sight line to the northeast make another 90-degree turn, and run a third sight line to the southeast. Make a final 90-degree turn, and run a fourth sight line to the southwest. This would bring them back to their original point of departure at Jones Point. These four sight lines formed the 10-mile square. Each corner of the square was perfectly oriented to the four cardinal points of the compass. After the survey was completed, Ellicott supervised the placement of 40 boundary markers around the perimeter of the square. Banneker's final assignment was to establish a meridian line which would indicate the midpoint of the 10-mile square and the exact position of the sun at high noon on the vernal equinox. This meridian line not only divided the 10-mile square in half, 
It also established the meridian as the primary corridor of spiritual energy within the newly created capital. This meridian line is the first stop on our field trip. Before we visit the meridian line, we must acquaint you with the symbolic meaning of seven numbers that will be referenced throughout our field trip. Numbers have been used for thousands of years to represent esoteric, philosophical, and religious concepts. The numbers one through seven are critical to our study of the city. The number one represents the creator, the source of all life, which was often depicted as the sun. Two represents man and woman, who were made from the creator. Three represents the child, who was made from man and woman acting as co-creators. Four represents a square, the base or foundation upon which a new life begins. Five represents man. Man has five parts of his body, a head, two arms, and two legs. Woman has five fingers, five toes, and five senses. Man is actually a Sanskrit word which means mind and has no sexual connotation. In this context, the word woman literally means the womb that produces man or mind. Six represents death. From the earliest times, the dead were buried in a coffin, a six-sided box. They were carried to their grave by six pallbearers and they were buried under six feet of earth. Originally, the numbers 666 symbolized the death of the body, mind, and spirit of the deceased, and not the devil as we are now taught. Seven represents heaven, the place where the dead are reborn. You now know the story of Asar was the first resurrection story in history, but did you know that the ancient Kemites identified seven levels of heaven and that Asar was resurrected in a land called the Seventh Heaven. In his new role as the Lord of Judgment, one could say that Asar was the first president of the 700 Club. Knowledge of ancient history profoundly affects our interpretation of modern history. With these new insights into the past, you are now ready to begin your field trip. Be mindful that everything you see, from the numbered streets to the street numbers, the shape of the city to its orientation and monuments, all has been carefully determined by men who sought to recreate here along the Potomac the architectural, symbolic, and spiritual culture that once thrived along the Nile. It is our intention to reacquaint you with this ancient wisdom so that you will know who you were, who you are, and who you can become. As you prepare to leave the bus and begin your walk through Meridian Hill Park, sharpen your eye and tune your ear so you'll know what you see and understand what you hear. The Washington Monument at 555 feet high is the world's tallest freestanding Masonic structure. It is a symbol that represents the capital of the most powerful nation on earth. The Washington Monument is actually a copy of an African monument honoring Asar, the first king of Kemet, who died and was resurrected more than 6,000 years ago. In ancient Kemet, Asar's monument was called a Tekken. Originally, it represented the one part of Asar's body which Aset never found, his phallus. After the spirit of Asar impregnated Aset, his virgin wife, she gave birth to their son Heru on December 25th. As an adult, Heru avenged the murder of his father and reclaimed the throne of Kemet. After the defeat of Set, Heru took the form of a falcon and flew into heaven to inform Asar of his victory. The victorious Heru 
was depicted as a winged sun disk called a Heru Bedet. A Bedet was carved above the entrance of every temple to commemorate Heru's victory over Set. When Heru reclaimed the throne of Kemet, Asa was reborn as the Lord of Resurrection and he presided over the souls of the deceased as he sat on the throne of judgment. After Asar was born again, the Tekken represented his victory over death. 6,000 years after the resurrection of Asar, you will find the world's tallest Tekken in Washington, D.C. Inside the Washington Monument, above the elevator and plaque of George Washington, you will find a Heru Bedet, the winged sun disk of Heru. Within the center of the sun disk is a stylized six-pointed star which represents Asar and Aset. You will find Tekkenu in Arlington Cemetery and a pair of Tekkenu in front of George and Martha Washington's tomb in Mount Vernon, Virginia. There is also a Tekken above Thomas Jefferson's grave in Monticello, Virginia. Are these an unusual series of coincidences or are they a few of the many secrets which have been hidden in plain sight? Shortly after the founding of the United States of America, George Washington commissioned a team of men to design a great seal to represent the heart and soul of the new nation. It took these men six years, from 1776 until 1782, to design the symbols which adorned the back of the dollar bill. As you can probably guess by now, ancient Kemet was the inspiration for their design. There are two Kemetic objects on the reverse of the Great Seal, the Pyramid and the All-Seeing Eye. The pyramid is comprised of 13 rows of stone that are said to represent the 13 colonies that were founded in 1776, the year inscribed in Roman numerals at the base of the pyramid. The inspiration for this design is obviously African because there are more than 300 pyramids in Egypt and the Sudan, but there are no pyramids in the United States or Europe. The eye above the pyramid is said to represent the eye of God who sees everything that happens on the earth below. This symbol was derived from the eye of Heru. Heru's eye, like that of the Creator, was positioned high above the earth and able to see everything that happened on the planet. The image of Heru as a falcon was the national symbol for ancient Kemet. It also was the inspiration for the eagle as the national symbol of the United States in front of the Great Seal. When you compare both symbols, you can see the similarity between the two. What is important to note is that the symbol on the right was created 6,000 years before the symbol on the left. Both creatures are birds of prey. Both are looking to their right and both have stars above their heads. Is this a coincidence or is it another secret hidden in plain sight? The Library of Congress is the greatest repository of culture and knowledge in the history of mankind. It contains more than 125 million artifacts from around the world. The Thomas Jefferson Building was the first of three structures now known as the Library of Congress. Built in 1897, the Jefferson Building is the oldest cultural institution in the city. There are 33 heads above the first floor windows at the entrance, rear, and four corners of the Jefferson Building. They were designed to represent the 33 races that inhabit the earth. Upon closer examination, you will see that these heads actually represent much more. There are four heads at the entrance on First Street. They represent the Russian Slav, blind European, brunette European, and the modern Greek. Some of the heads on the southern corners represent the Persian, Hindu, Semite, Polynesian, and Australian. Some of the heads on the northern corners represent the Fujian, Plains Indian, Korean, 
Japanese, and Chinese. The five heads at the rear of the library on 2nd Street represent the Negrito, Zulu, Papian, Sudan Negro, and the Aka. What do these 33 heads mean? As you recall, the number four represents foundation. Thus, the four heads at the front of the library represent Russia, Northern and Southern Europe, and Greece, the founding civilizations of Europe and the United States. You also recall that the number five represents man. Thus, the five heads at the rear of the library represent the modern African descendants of Homo sapiens sapien, the first humans. Symbolically, the 33 ethnological heads represent the monogenetic origins of humanity and the speciation of mankind, the kinds of men who evolved from the original man in Africa. More than 110 years ago, men carved secrets in stone. But in the January 11, 1988 issue of Newsweek, geneticists presented irrefutable evidence proving to the world that humanity did begin in Africa more than 200,000 years ago. It is now an accepted fact that the first man and woman were of African origin, and all humanity carries their DNA. A further analysis of the Jefferson Building also suggests that the 33 heads refer to the 33rd degree of masonry, where members also learn of the monogenetic origins of mankind. If you recall, the temple room on the second floor of the House of the Temple is where the 33rd degree is conferred. The temple room is a cube whose height, width, and depth are 33 feet each. It is also surrounded by 33 columns that are 33 feet high. The heads at the front and rear of the Jefferson Building also relate to the plaques near the door of the Scottish Rite Temple at 16th and Harvard Streets. The plaque on the left reads, From the east comes light. The plaque on the right reads, From the west comes law. The east represents light, or the knowledge that came out of Kemet. The west represents the European discovery of the light and its application as the rule of law which governs their society. The five African heads at the rear of the Jefferson Building face east and see Kepret, the light of the sun, rising in the east every morning. Four heads at the front of the Jefferson Building face west. They look at the capital, where the laws are made. This is not a coincidence. It was a secret which, up until now, has been hidden in plain sight. There are additional details of the John Adams Building of the Library of Congress that your facilitator will share with you upon your return to the IKG Cultural Resource Center. In the meantime, consider these words of wisdom, which were inscribed at the entrance to the James Madison Building of the Library of Congress. Knowledge will forever govern ignorance, and a people who mean to be their own governors must arm themselves with the power which knowledge gives. I trust that this field trip has opened your eyes to knowledge that has always been available to you, literally right in front of your eyes. These details may have been overlooked due to a lack of awareness or a lack of interest. Now that you have been exposed to this knowledge, you will never look at yourself or the world the same. Remember that everything counts. Everything is important and has meaning and value. As you continue to learn and expand your horizon, know that you can become the governor of your life. You can create a better world for yourself, your loved ones, and your community. Remember that knowledge is power, and both must always be used wisely. We thank you for joining us on the Egypt on the Potomac field trip, and your facilitator will now entertain questions. Hotep.
Let's <laughs> go. <laughs> 